This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. LinkedIn. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. And Front. Transform your corporate email into a multiplayer game so your team can increase customer experience and take action faster. Take 20% off your first year today by using the code TWIST at sign up and visit frontapp.com slash twist for more information. That's F-R-O-N-T app.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is our news roundtable. A lot of news going on. We're trying to get you at least one weekly news roundtable. Thanks for all the great feedback. As you guys know, I'm an angel investor here in Silicon Valley, and if you want to read the deal memos that I write when I'm investing in a company, go to thesyndicate.com, thesyndicate.com, or follow the syndicate 415 that's the area code here, um, and just DM us, and we'll add you to the syndicate list, and you can read my deal memo. So when I invest in a company like com.com, I write a deal memo, I send it out, a bunch of investors put money in, uh, and then uh, we hope for the best. So if you want to read those deal memos and you're accredited and you want to... Um, see what it's like to be an angel investor, go ahead and go to the syndicate.com and sign up. Today on the program, I've got Austin Allred back on the pod. You know him as the outspoken CEO and co-founder of Lambda School. He was on the pod, I don't know, what, six months ago? Oh, it would have been like 18 months ago. 18 months ago, ago, a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, and Time I know flies. things have been going great, but there's also been a little bit of uh, a brouhaha. Mm -hmm. So thanks for coming on the pod to talk about that. Yeah, we'll get into that so. in the first uh, segment. Catherine Boyle is here. She's a partner at General Catalyst and formerly a journalist mm -hmm. uh, like myself. Uh, she was at the Washington Post from 2010 to 2014. I was. So you'll have some some uh, feelings. Yes. Some All feel the feels. That's a good way to put it. Some feelings. All the feels. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's just get right into it. Uh, everybody knows Lambda School is uh, trying to teach people how to code. And I saw a New York Magazine article, what was it, two weeks ago now that you've been dealing with? Or? Yeah, something like that. And they allege you misrepresented some stats on graduation, 50% versus 86%. Um, they seem uh, to be confused a little bit about the ISAs, income sharing agreements, uh, maybe some complaints about the enrollment, and uh, maybe the team leaders are overtasked or underprepared is what they claimed. You came out and were super transparent. You explained exactly what the confusion is. Uh, you've had times when you've had 85% of graduates uh, get hired, which is unbelievable. Uh, you've had, uh, in the article reference, a 50% hiring rate, but that was in the risks part of your uh, deal memo in a mock exercise, yeah, correct? Yeah, so, so let me speak to this just a yeah, little bit. Yeah, explain this to everybody who saw this brouhaha. At a high level, when we talk to investors, we talk in terms of enrolled students because our costs all come from enrolled students, right? So we'll say, of those students who were enrolled, X percent were hired. Whereas when schools report publicly, they speak in terms of graduated students. Right. Um, so obviously those two numbers are always going to be different because some people will drop out and then you'll have a different denominator. Right. So the reporter just took a number that was different and compared it against a different metric. Hmm. Um, that said, that 86% was somewhat out of date. Like it had been a while since we updated our numbers, but sure. it was the most up-to-date number we had. So we you know, quickly put together what the real numbers would have been, um, which was 78% instead of 86%. Which so is basically the same number. But not drastic. Well, I mean, it's going to change between classes as well, correct? Of course, of course. Um, so it was, I, yeah, it was, it was somebody who didn't understand what numbers they were looking at comparing two different things. And also, you know, you refer to this person as a reporter. In fact, I'm in touch with the person because, you know, I was defending you publicly. I'm not an investor to be clear, but I just thought this was like a slam piece that was ridiculous. I defended you publicly. He got in touch with me and I was like, there's something weird here. I, how long have you been writing? I don't see any other bylines for you. And this person is a, a founder, not correct, a journalist. So when they approached you, did you know they were not a journalist and they were another founder writing what is for New York Magazine what, an opinion piece? Well, so when he approached, he said, hey, you know, I'm writing an article about the 
the code boot camp space in general? Um, and could I get, you know, a couple lines from you, which, you know, we do that stuff all the time. They're right. writing, you know, ISAs are a new thing. They're trying to understand. Um, but yeah, it was, and then it came in very aggressive and on the phone. When you talked to him, uh, he actually came into the office, came to the office uh-huh. and then got aggressive in person. I mean, I would really? call it aggressive. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't, you know, aggressive I don't, questioning. Yeah. It was, it was intense, right? Like more intense than any other in, you know, we, we've had other bad articles written about us, but nothing right. quite like that. I don't know. It's just weird. What was the ax to grind? Do you think? Because he seemed to have some code product that he was working on previously. I asked him what his axe to grind was, and he, yeah, he was just straight up like, Austin's a liar. And I was like, well, it doesn't seem like that. And it seems like the overwhelming people number of people coming to Lambda School are getting jobs. Yeah, I don't know. This It's something that I've been trying to figure out is why, I mean, there is a very small pocket of people who very much do not like me. Um, well, I mean, join the club. You, you've Welcome. got your own. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> Catherine's laughing. She's like, what did I get myself into? Oh, well, you're outspoken. Yeah, I'm definitely outspoken. And I think he felt like we were, like, I'm a, above and beyond in our marketing, which mm. is fair at times. But it's certainly n- never been fraudulent or intentionally misleading or anything like that. Catherine, if you were advising Austin as his as a former journalist and an investor now, should he have even taken the meeting with New York Magazine? Or would you do what I do? Which is say, send me your questions. I'll answer them by email. Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting question because I think even if you're advising someone to be very judicious about who they take meetings with, it's impossible to know now. Right. I mean, there are so many different media platforms. Journalists have very different views of what's appropriate and what's not across from, you know, Wall Street Journal investigative unit has very different uh, values and ethics requirements than, say, a blogger who is just starting out. So my advice, I actually think that your response was the, the right response. And we're seeing this from a lot of CEOs. Fred Smith did this with the with the New York Times or, or when he didn't agree with with some of the things that were published. So I think being very upfront when something's published and, and exactly what you did, like here are our numbers, we're going to be very forthcoming and very transparent. That's just the new norm for CEOs. Go direct. Go direct. Yep. And, and that is the new norm for, for anyone who is an influencer of any kind, but specifically CEOs and companies, you have to be open. Yeah, which is, I mean, one of the reasons I invited you on the pod, because I've always known you to be very direct. The thing that I also find very puzzling about this is and this is where the story broke down to me. And of course, this gets published on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Everybody who hates tech right now, which is a lot of people, largely because of let's say the election and Facebook's role in it. I think my personal belief. But then everybody starts dunking on you, mm-hmm. and it spreads like wildfire. And if you read the story, and if you just have a cursory knowledge of what you're doing, if a person comes to Lambda School and they do not get a job. And they, when they come in, my understanding is because I have a close friend whose uh, husband is in the program right now. I won't say who. You can either pay twenty thousand dollars or have thirty thousand dollars in deferred ISA. Mm-hmm. Am I ballpark correct? That's that's roughly correct. Yep. The person I know paid the twenty thousand. They had a little bit of money. They said, "Yeah, we don't need to pay it over time. We'll pay the twenty thousand, and, and we'll get a job after whatever nine months of the program. I think it's nine month program." Yep. The people who pay the thirty thousand deferred with an income sharing agreement mm-hmm. wind up paying forty or fifty thousand dollars of their uh, back over time. No, oh no, thirty thousand is the max. Thirty thousand so, is the max. So the way it works is you pay a percentage of your income for two years, seventeen percent for two years, if and only if you're making more than fifty k in a role that you trained for. Got it. If not, you pay zero. And so, thirty thousand dollars is the maximum. So there will be students that pay seventeen thousand dollars because they only get a $50,000 a year job. Right. So you have to be making north of 86, 87K to pay $30,000. So what's interesting about this is, and I don't mean to just become like your PR person and your media counsel, Austin, but if it was me, I would just come out dunking. Like, you people are idiots. There is no downside. You don't understand what an ISA is. You dipshit idiot reporters (laughs) have no idea that there is zero downside to going to Lambda School. Because if you don't get a job, you are not responsible. And the debt wipes out after how many years? Five years. Okay. So, Catherine, to just pause here for a second and consider the insanity of this. The person takes no risk. Lambda takes 100% of the risk. If the person doesn't get a well-paying job over 50K... They pay zero. 
Correct. If they get a job outside of tech and develop being a developer, they pay zero. Well, being a developer is, I mean, you'd pay if you're a developer outside of tech, right? right. If, if you end up being a bartender, for example. You're not paying. Then you don't pay. A waiter in the U.S., pay. that's the not US. true in the EU, but in the U.S., yes. Right. So you're not on the hook, and it wipes away after five years. Catherine, in co- for college, you cannot even go bankrupt and wipe out college debt, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So- Austin, you have created the giant mitzvah of all mitzvahs for all of young people who might want to transition. And the payback he gets is people don't even understand that nobody's on the hook. Hmm. How insane is this? Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, Austin and I have had this conversation offline before, but I was once in that boat when hmm. I wanted to leave journalism. I was, you know, not paid very well and was looking to improve my life and ended up going to business school. But that sort of solution of you don't have to pay anything up front actually speaks to a huge sector of the American public that is terrified of taking on more debt, especially the people who've already taken on debt, who went to university, they believed the American dream and said you can better yourself with college, and then got out of college and were paid $25,000 to do an entry level job and really can't afford to live in a city. Do you want to turn your idea into a website? Do you want to blog and publish content, maybe sell products or your service, promote your physical or online business, or maybe you're doing an event or a special project? Well, Squarespace is the answer. If you want to have a beautiful website set up in no time at all with e-commerce functionality, their award-winning uh, customer support, and templates that are responsive and work on any device, Squarespace is beautiful and it's all optimized for mobile, where most customers are coming from these days. You can also buy a domain and choose from over 200 extensions right on Squarespace. So it's so easy breezy. Boom, you get your domain, you get your website, you get your e-commerce set up, and you got that support if you need it. Here's a demo of Presh using uh, Squarespace's templates to build a beautiful photography template for his passion project, superhumanwallpaper.com, which showcases all of the Inbox Zero images that he gets at the end of the day. So go to squarespace.com right now for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use the offer code TWIST and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go to squarespace.com, get that free trial. The website, it will look beautiful. Your website's going to look gorgeous. They have so many beautiful templates. And the best part is everybody on your team is going to know how to edit and clean and crisp up that website with new content whenever you need it. They just keep making the product better and better over the years. They are the gold standard for building beautiful websites. Go ahead and go to squarespace.com and get that free trial. Use the promo code TWIST to save 10% off. Let alone the University of Phoenix reports, allegedly, University of Phoenix and other places, people taking massive loans that are due immediately no matter what the outcome is. Yep. Uh, and doing that to GIs who are getting out on these GI bills where they can take loans. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you came into the industry, there were a lot of these Fugazi players, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so we set up Lambda School to be a counter to all of that, right? So what if there were a world where you only paid if you're successful, and then it eliminates all of the incentive to do all of the shady stuff that the rest of for-profit education is doing? Um, now, there's still things that it doesn't eliminate, which you correctly pointed out. Like, you still have to put time and effort in. There's nothing we can do to absolve that. Oh, you can't go back in time and let people <laughs> change their decision and give them back nine months of learning? This was the stupidest response from this idiotic journalist slash person with an ax to grind who I will have on the program, and I will take him to task. I didn't want to do it with you here. I'll get your side. I'll get him on here next if he's brave enough to come on here and explain what his ax to grind is. But shame on you, New York Magazine, for letting this person do this ridiculous article in the face of you trying to solve education. And the reason everybody knows about ISA is I don't want to make you cry here, Austin. I see you getting a little emotional. No, I'm not crying. Don't get emotional. <laughs> but I just want to say, I did not understand what the ISA was. I was not attuned to what you're doing and the mission. And the world, especially in Silicon Valley and out of it now, now understand what an ISA is and the value of it. And I understand universities are now watching Lambda. And because you're the tip of the spear, they're following you. And now they're going to do ISAs. This is correct, right? Correct. What are they thinking at New York Magazine? And this is why I had this argument with Kara Swisher on her podcast recently about late stage journalism. We're now in this like end game of journalism before it collapses and has to be rebooted, I believe where they're so obsessed with clicks. They're so obsessed with having like a woke, get a tribal response from the left or the right. 
because the right obviously was guilty of it with Fox News. And now the left is like, you know what? We lost to Fox News. Let's be like them. Let's take a story. And instead of telling the truth, let's dunk on tech because that will get us more clicks. And really the narrative is going to be, oh, you become a billionaire because of Lambda. I hope you become a billionaire becomes a Lambda because if you do, that means tens of thousands of people will have become developers. There's no way for you to become rich off the startup or your investors unless you produce, what, hundreds of thousands of developers. Correct. What was the response from your board and your team when you have a PR crisis like this? How do you handle it? Because this is the first time you've had to handle it in your life, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, so we've had people who write bad or confused articles in the past. Um, but this was the, I guess, and there was kind of a stream of them because there were like three or four all that landed at the same time. Um, but our, our board was just, you know, hey, so our response internally is always, you know, try to block it out and like focus on the students. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, as, as long as our students are successful, like it doesn't really matter what New York Magazine writes. And that's the thing that I've been surprised by is how little effect that actually has at the end of the day. Yes. And if journalists are going to continue to take a side, they will continue to fall victim to exactly what Trump wants, which is to say fake news. Yep. Like mm -hmm. this literally is an example of New York Magazine being fake news. It's literally, and I don't want to say that. I'm as anti-Trump as any person could possibly be. I will vote for anybody to get him out of office. This is actually my biggest fear about what's happening me with media is you have great journalists at these great institutions that are still doing investigative reporting. They're still playing by a rule book that has been around for decades of how you identify yourself, how you, how you ask questions. And unfortunately, I think the influencer-led institutions that have taken this kind of, we have a point of view and we're going to go after a certain thing and we're going to say what we believe and it's going to be more opinion journalism than it's going to be actually investigative journalism, they've actually hurt the real institutions that are doing important work. And so I think it's important for the media to say there is a difference between the Washington Post and Recode. Yeah. There's a huge difference between New York Mag now owned by Vox and the Wall Street Journal investigative unit. Which, and by the way, both of these are owned by Vox. So I don't mean to yeah. beat up on them, but yeah. I told uh, Kara Swisher this whole story on coronavirus mm -hmm. with... Um, what's his name? The VC? Bology. 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 Uh, just making them look incredibly stupid immediately after publishing it and now as time goes on and events are actually being canceled and people were always saying stop giving handshakes they literally made the lead to that story i don't know if you saw it yep. silicon valley terrorized of handshakes yeah. it's so dumb yeah and it's and it's a public health story i mean this Apology is was so clearly right and in retrospect there's nothing that you can do like i think i honestly think that is the first tipping point where people realize like i mean bology was approached by a reporter he called it out correctly. He said, hey, you're going to write an article about handshakes and on Sand Hill Road, and that's not what you should be writing about. You should be writing about the pending right. epidemic health crisis. He tried to help the right reporter, like uh, literally tried to help them. And they, yeah, they, they wrote the article he said he was going to write, and it was wrong in all of the ways that Balaji thought it was going to be wrong. Like, that shouldn't have been the story in the first place. It was only, they approached him with the narrative already created. And th this that's the thing that drives me crazy, is when you have a reporter who's already made up their mind and they're not looking for comment. We had an article written about us where I had, you know, an hour and a half long interview with the reporter and the only quote they used was so out of context that because it fit the narrative that they right. came in wanting to write about. This is the worst part of it is, and this is why I'm advising founders. I'm advising founders for the rest of 2020 and I'll make a decision on 2021 going forward. But as the chairman of startups, <laughs> which I just anointed myself, as the chairman of all startups, uh, I'm going to uh, pass an edict right now. No founders of any venture-backed or angel-backed startups are to talk to any journalist on the phone or at events. You can answer questions only by email and or DM, and you will publish all complete interviews on your personal corporate blog or your medium. And we will teach journalists how to do what they should be doing, which is go right down the middle. The truth. How about that? So I do actually think there are some journalists, though, and 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 I know it's it's it. 
being a former journalist, I think I'm still, you know, very much longing for kind of the old school way of yes. practicing journalism. I do think it's important that we have journalists that are empowered to speak truth to power, particularly in politics and tech, like where there is a lot of power. Um, so I, I'm not, a, I think email is a great way to do it, but I do think that there are journalists that practice very well and that can do things in, in person. I, I, I'm actually very optimistic about journalism. This might sound a little contrarian, but I think that we're entering a golden age of journalism and podcasting has actually helped this where you have to have nuance and you have to have real thoughtful conversations if you're going to talk to someone for an hour. So I actually am very excited about the way journalism is headed. I think these sorts of kind of last cries of sort of, you know, flailing. Um, fl- yeah, I, I think there's, Late there's, stage journalism. there's some, some issues there, but I think we're going to have a multitude of voices coming to to speak in different platforms. And podcasting is a really great way to speak to someone and get the truth. It doesn't just have to be email. It doesn't just have to be yeah. a PR person answering on behalf of a person of power. Well, And, and look at it. I, I, Austin, I just said to you on Twitter publicly, like, hey, come on the pod if you want to talk about it. I, you know, I'll give you the platform. And you're like, yeah, of course. Because you know I'm going to ask you a hard question. Like, what's the real number? And you know you can answer it mm-hmm. in your own words. And if it takes 10 minutes or 30 minutes, so be it. I think that's the hard thing in this day and age is there's no nuance if i mean if the reporter doesn't want there to be nuance there will not be nuance yeah. right and at times that may be appropriate um but i feel i don't know i f- i find it rare that there's a time when i'm saying oh i wish there were less nuance in the way that was discussed or the way that was written yeah i think all of us would hope for some nuance when we turn on the nightly news tonight like literally does not exist cuz nuance does not get you clicks if they said um, Lambda School uh, reporting variable results by class of between 50 and 86 percent or 75, it'd be like, okay, great. Thanks for the data point. I'm not clicking. But if they're like, oh, Lambda School is reporting one number to investors and one to the public, it's like, oh, my God. Ridiculous. All right. When we get back, as if the world wasn't bad enough with late stage journalism collapsing, uh, <laughs> I think a, a right wing Republican maniac wants to buy Twitter and oust Jack. So Facebook already owned by the far right via Peter Thiel and Zuckerberg, who secretly invested, uh, voted for uh, Trump, from what I understand. I think he's a Trump voter. That's what I've been hearing, that he's secretly voting for Trump. Uh, who are you hearing this from? Me, I just made it up. Okay. <laughs> just my intuition. <laughs> Thank you, though. Fake news, 2020. When we get back, will Twitter also become uh, a tool of the right like Facebook. And we come back on this week's service. Hiring great people is the way to grow your business. You know this. But how do you do that and run your business at the same time? Hiring is a huge time suck. It's the biggest time suck. We all know that. I have a perfect solution for you to get talent right now. It's called LinkedIn Jobs, and it makes it simple and easy. They screen candidates with all the hard and soft skills that you need so you can hire the right person right now. LinkedIn looks beyond the work skills. No, it's not just that. They also put your job in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly. Things like collaboration, creativity, and adaptability. That's how LinkedIn Make sure your job post is seen by the people you want to hire, people with the skills, qualifications, and other interests that will help your business grow. And it's no wonder a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn. Here's an example, Takeoffs.io, one of my portfolio companies that we found when we were in Sydney and they moved to the United States. They are an AI-enabled building materials marketplace. So if you're building something, they use AI to say, hey, here's how much wood, here's how many bricks you need. You get the idea. Well, they were looking for an AI engineering lead, which is a tough role to hire for because they required a very unique skill set. They used LinkedIn Talent Solutions to find a qualified candidate. In fact, somebody with a PhD in computer vision so they can look at these floor plans and figure out what you need in terms of materials. You get the idea. Well, that person has now been with them for over a year and they've rolled out several major projects and they're like really been a game changer for takeoffs.io. Examples like this are why companies rated LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. So here is your call to action. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and you'll get the first $50, 50 for free. Just visit linkedin.com slash twist. Again, that's linkedin.com slash T-W-I-S-T and get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions do apply because they're giving you a 50. 
All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, everybody, welcome back. Austin Allred is here. He, you can follow him on the Twitter, A-U-S-T-E-N. Uh, welcome to the First Name Club, by the way. Thank you. You got that it's worked out? It's good to out? be there, yeah. yeah. it's good to be there, isn't it? Yeah. It's a nice feeling. Uh, I lost Catherine, my verification, but yeah, what whatever. can you do? No, no, you want to go full name. <laughs> uh, Catherine Boyle is also here. Uh, she's KTM Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E, partner at General Catalyst. Uh, so... And just, to, we, you know, we go to commercial break and then the real conversation happens. So I was saying during the commercial break, like, yeah, we went a little hard there in the first segment or two on journalists. We want them to do a good job, right? We do. We need journalists. We I mean, need they are, journalists. They are, they are an incredibly important force for democracy. And my message to everybody is pay for good journalism. I'm paying for everything now. Yes. I see Subscribe. a paywall, I just buy it. I'm spending yeah. probably three grand on publications this year. Good. And, <laughs> well, I'm rich. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, a lot of money. Who cares? Anyway. So my everybody... Yeah. yeah, so if you're listening to this, just spend three thousand dollars on journal. No, I do for my <laughs> companies and whatever. You know, I'll buy whatever's out there. Um, uh, because we need to give them more resources so they spend more time and stop using stringers who are not even journalists to write slam pieces so they can get desperately get clicks to get ads that you know are terrible ads anyway. Pay yeah. for journalism, I think, is uh, the solution here. Yeah. yeah, the incentives are broken for sure. Yeah, yeah, if the incentive is get clicks. <laughs> Taking a side is the way to win, mm -hmm. and going down the middle is a way to lose. Yeah, and also and investigative journalism is very difficult to do. Sure, you know it's it's one of these things where when they start you out as a journalist, like as a cub reporter, you're doing the easiest form you can of investigative journalism, looking at documents that are already there for you, and then you kind of graduate. And so I do think that it's a craft, and that people have to practice it over years to be very good at it. And yeah. and hopefully, if we pay for journalism, the people who've been doing investigative reporting for twenty and thirty years can continue to do it. And I have uh, also, as part of my edict for no founders to talk to journalists in 2020 in person or on the phone, I will uh, I will make an exception for any journalist who calls me and says, hey, can you tell me about two or three interesting companies that I could profile that are doing interesting things in the world? Mm -hmm. So if you write two or three of those stories as a journalist in the next year or next six months, let's put it, of just not a slam piece, just an interesting story about an interesting technology or founder, I will then put you on the whitelist and you can talk to, in person to those journalists. That's Everybody. fair. I think it's a fair decision. Not entirely one-sided. <laughs> I feel like I've made a good I've made a good ruling here. Uh, <laughs> as each, I don't know why I think I have any say in any of this. Um, oh, I'm just waiting for the Twitter backlash. <laughs> well, no, here's the thing that happened to me. <laughs> when I came out in defense of you um, and Balaji, I had a ton of people come to me and say, right on, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a ton of people who said, I don't want to, and this is something that should be concerning to Kara Swisher, I don't want to publicly come out and defend so I will like it, but I won't retweet it. So literally, people have told me this. I'll like your tweet. I won't retweet it, and I won't reply to it, and I won't put a tweet of my own out there because I don't want to be on Kara Swisher's bad side. I don't want to get on the bad side of Vox. I don't want to get on the bad side of New York Magazine or the New York Times. So literally, founders and VCs are scared of confronting journalists when they make a mistake. I confronted the journalist who wrote the Corona piece with the handshakes, and I said, what did you learn from this? Or are you going to do a follow-up piece? crickets not one response which is crazy if you got it that wrong you have an obligation to write a follow-up piece and she refuses which is really disappointing uh, and it, you should be very scared as a journalist if people are scared to give you frank advice but they're telling me on dms like right on mm -hmm. uh, i don't care i'm on platform all right new york-based firm elliott management has nominated four directors to the board they're seeking to replace jack dorsey as the ceo uh, for upcoming elections I don't know how, what percentage they bought. And in related news, the U.S. State Department uh, discovered uh, that there are millions of coronavirus tweets publishing false information. I'm sure this is Putin just uh, doing what he loves to do, create chaos in America. Great job, Putin. Uh, so I guess the, the big I issue here is, is Twitter broken? And if it is broken, how do you fix it? Because it seems like it's doing pretty good right now. I mean, the product's definitely improved over the past. I mean, as an avid Twitter user, it's getting yeah. dramatically better. And an I, addict, you would say. You're addicted. Fair to say. <laughs> Me definitely too. Definitely fair to say. Are you addicted? I, I've gotten more addicted over time, which means the product's probably getting better. <laughs> do you wait? This, this is how you know if you're addicted. When you wake up, do you look at Twitter in the first hour when you wake 100%, up? 100%. Absolutely. Do you? The first hour? I was going to well, no, say first, with the first 10 hour. minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now we'll go to first 10. Do you look yeah. at it in the first 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Is it the first thing you look at? Depends. Email, SMS? No, email's definitely first for me. Yeah. For me, it's SMS, email, Twitter. I mean, that's what I just do. Yeah. I'm trying to push Twitter more and more into passive than active. 
Yeah, um, it's hard to do. It is hard to do. I did it when I was writing my book. I came up with a really good idea. I put Buffer on my phone. I deleted Twitter off my phone. Mm-hmm. So I could post to Twitter. I just couldn't see what the responses were. Mm-hmm. So there was a- Which is kind of dangerous when you think about it. I actually, for a while, gave my password. I had my chief of staff change my password, so I didn't even know my Twitter password. So I didn't, I mean, I, there, I went a month without logging in. Um, just so happens that that's when the New York Magazine article comes yeah. out, so I need to, to rectify that. But <laughs> Well, you were working on a funding round, I understand, and you closed it. Correct. Congratulations on that. What does that do for Lambda? Um, so it, it makes it so that us, mm-hmm. along with investors, are funding the, the cost of tuition for the students, mm-hmm. um, and then the investors get their money back first, and we make our money on the upside. But what it makes it is so we don't have to fund everything with VC. Um, so much better because that's not a sustainable model. So, you know, no. VCs don't want to fund student tuition. So people are rolling up <clears throat> in a way that they would roll up mortgages or other loans. Mm-hmm. They roll them up and they buy a hundred students at a time. Yes, but it's it's structured in mm-hmm. such a way that so we get an advance that uh-huh. is based on what our recent hiring data has been, um, and that advance doesn't cover right now doesn't even cover half of the cost of a student. Got it. So we take that advance, we supplement our own cash. So it's basically like a loan against the Perfect. ISA. So it's exactly what it should be. Somebody was telling me that they found that like offensive or something. Oh no, you know what was Anand on Twitter? You know, the guy with the great hair? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, who wrote the book, like Winners Take All? I'm trying to get him on the pod, but I think he's afraid to debate me because he knows I'll just dunk on him so <laughs> relentlessly about being a former management consultant who couldn't make it in the real world that he decided that billionaires shouldn't be able to give their money away. But his thing was like, look at where we've come to. People are rolling up student loans. I was like, They've always done that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's... It's always been that way. It's one of those things that, like, if your only exposure to <clears throat> finance is watching the big short, then, like, yeah. that's the only thing you know. And you don't realize that literally every single type of financial asset is traded. sold and traded and bought. Of and there's a real-time market. And, and that's good. And, yeah, I mean, if we... It's so much better for our students that we do it that way than if we fund it with VC. Um, and our incentives are still totally aligned. Like, that's the thing that everybody missed. Um, is they assume that we're just like selling off all this paper and the only the only thing they have to compare it to is 2008. So they think we're a subprime, you know, CDO creator. But that's not the case. Like you mm-hmm. can structure those instruments in a million different ways and we chose a way that would keep our How many uh, students do you put into a bundle, I'm curious, in order to have the right, you know... Uh, call it a thousand. A thousand, wow. So if you get this right, you could open Lambda School in every country in the world. That's the hope. And literally train anybody who wants for free. I mean, my with an ISA. With yeah, back, my, pay, my, pay, my pay if it works. North Star is that in ten years, nobody has to take on student debt that they won't be able to pay off ever again. Amazing. That's the goal. How dare you try to make the world better <laughs> and be a and when you see this, Catherine, it, this is what is great about capitalism, is it mm-hmm. not? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because I actually think there's a reason why companies like yours and why the tech lash is, is happening. And part of it is because I think we're on this 30-year journey of privatizing a lot of the functions of government. Mm. And to your point, the people who are most upset about this are people who really believe in public education, state-funded everything. If we can't make things work in the private sector, government has to take care of them. And since the 80s, we've been privatizing a lot of these functions and mm. globally, not just yeah. in the US. And so if we can figure out ways that students benefit, that you know, investors like myself can invest in, and make a return that funds pension funds and endowments. Like that's a good thing if everyone is aligned. To your point about incentives having to be aligned, but I think some people are just terrified that a lot of the primary roles of government are being outsourced to Silicon Valley, and that's definitely happen ha- happening. But I think it's a good thing, right. particularly if, if incentives are aligned, as you said. I think that's exactly right. The main pushback, and I've had everybody from you know, I've had senators tell me this kind of off record that look, if I help you succeed then I am voting against free private education for everybody, Mm. free college for everybody. Um, So I can't vote for you. I can't hope that you're, we had a, uh, we're supporting a bill that was on the floor of Congress that would regulate ISAs and make them more consumer friendly. And they said, if we support that, then that takes the wind out of the sails of the free college for all argument. And I mean, I think DHH was on the podcast and that was his main contention as well. Yeah, that was his main contention. It all should be free. Well, here's the thing. What you've done is free. It's free unless you get a job. And if you get a job, you pay a de minimis amount. A developer paying $30,000 a year is the all thousand total. 30,000 total if they deferred it over five, over 2 years. 
and it's wiped out after five. Can you imagine if student loans worked that way at colleges right now? We wouldn't be talking about the existential risk of the debt bubble. They they aren't because you can't make the numbers work with the outcomes that universities have. What is the outcome of universities in your research like for somebody who gets a computer science degree or any kind of degree from a, a good college? Yeah, so, so there's- 25%, 50% So the average- Six-year graduation rate, it, d it depends, right? If you're looking at Stanford, obviously it's high. If you're looking sure. at the average public university, it's a solid university if the six-year graduation rate is about 50%. Got like it. Like that's the target. Right, which is where you're starting. Like literally the lowest number they could yeah. find was 50%. Yeah, so I mean it's different. you've already exceeded yeah. what, and that's a, isn't that also a part of your selection process? Correct. So, I mean, our selection process is you go through 40 hours of pre-course work. We make sure that you're dedicated and we have to, right? Because we're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars training you. If we think that you're going to be successful and you're not, we lose a ton of money. Mm. Um, universities don't have that incentive, right? Mm. The reason University of Phoenix was pulling in billions of dollars a year in federally backed student loans and didn't care is because they had no incentive to. If you sign your name on the dotted line, University of Phoenix gets paid. And whatever happens after that, that's up to you. And this is what it's about, right, Catherine? I mean, incentives matter. They do. Yes. And and I think, I mean, I think it's incredibly important that Silicon Valley start funding products that reach people in middle America, that it reaches people that are not just looking for the premium products that we've been investing in over the last 10, 15 years. Like, it's great that there's a crop of founders like Austin that are saying, actually, we want to fix problems. And we can do that now. So I think we need to see more of it. it. It's upsetting to see that, you know, you you probably will have a target on your back for for a long time because you are working on such important problems. But these are these are things that if tech can solve some of the biggest problems in society, we should try. We shouldn't just focus on premium services. We, we actually invested in a school called Dexter Learning out of Texas. It's just this incredible founder. Um, and he's doing he's, he's basically made an elementary school um, where you can drop off your kid for any 30 hours during the week, whether it's you know, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., I think. Mm -hmm. And it's all student-led, you know, uh, learning. So if, you know, you're ahead on math and you're ahead on English and I'm behind on both, mm -hmm. you guys can help me on both and you can help each other and move forward. And their mission explicitly is to make private school affordable for everybody by doing this student-led education in a beautiful space that looks kind of like a WeWork or a really beautiful designed office where parents can drop off. Now, if you're in favor of that product existing in the world, we're going to run into the same problem, which is being in favor of that means you're against public school education. Mm -hmm. So, Catherine, how should we look at this for in specifically college education versus primary education, I think they call it? Well, I think any way that, I mean, to your point about aligning incentives, any way that we can make sure that all people have access to great yeah. education and great services and that it's affordable for all people, like, I, I don't see anyone being upset with that. But I think where the real problem or the, the and I'll use the sector outside of education I invest heavily in defense technology and defense technology is a good example because the US government has not been investing in defense over the last 50 years and it's important that private companies augment the needs of the US government in that in that regard and that's less controversial because we've been doing it yeah. but the number of companies that are now trying to help with transportation case of Uber, education, all of these things that used to be just provided by by the government, I think that is where there's going to always be some tension and people who are saying that's a controversial thing to argue. And, and I think what the s socialists in, in that audience, the Anons of the world are missing, is consumers can opt out of using these services, whether mm -hmm. it's Lambda or Uber and Lyft uh, or any service, if it's not good, and there'll always be more com competition coming. Mm -hmm. So you'll have this natural defense. When we get back from this quick break, we're going to talk about DoorDash falling for their IPO. And I also want to hear more about this defense. I want to know, Catherine, if you invest in things uh, that fire and go boom, like weapons. Yeah. When we get back on This Week in Startup. Are you crazy about efficiency? Well, I am, and you know that. And if you're running a startup, you need to be super efficient. And you've probably got tons of SMS messages coming in, emails for customer support, and you're having all of these conversations in single player mode. In other words, you've got all these threads inside of your email. Well, what if you could play multiplayer email? Well, that's what Front let you do and I have a portfolio company named Look and they are a talent marketplace and we have invested in this company and their CEO Zach runs the entire company on front they've eliminated over 3,500 internal emails a month because he's better able to manage the team and what everybody's talking about with different customers if you want to find a better way to manage all of these emails 
Upfront will transform your corporate email into multiplayer so you can create simple little email addresses like support or team at your company. And you can do interesting things like put DMs into there or you can use Zapier to move these uh, interactions back and forth. You know how to do that. So if you want to be bionic, if you want to make your team able to handle this deluge and put out all these fires and manage all that work email, I want you to take 20% off your first year. That is a big, big, uh, generous offer from them. And it's a very affordable product, to be honest. They, they charge probably too little. It's front app, F-R-O-N-T-A-P-P dot com slash twist for more information. And just use that code twist when you sign up at frontapp.com slash twist. Everybody uses the product, not just my portfolio company. Look, many of portfolio companies are using it. I use it all the time. And Shopify, HubSpot, MailChimp, and over 5,500 other businesses around the world rely on Front to manage their email. It's a new approach to email. It's this team sport. And boy, does it make your company bionic. Go to frontapp.com slash twist. All right, Catherine Boyle is here and Austin Allred. Um... Before we went to break, you you dropped very subtly that you invest in military technology. Mm -hmm. I'm always curious about this because as investors, we typically have clauses we can't invest in vice, right? Gambling, mm -hmm. porn, whatever it happens to be, drugs, although a lot of that's changing now because of cannabis becoming legal, regulatory environments and society change. I'm curious what where the line is when you're investing in military technology. Do you look at uh, weapons and things that hurt people differently than technology that say support the troops would a would a gun be different than uh kevlar protection yeah so so we've made um two recent investments in military technology or defense technology broadly speaking mm. uh, vanivar labs which is a company that's selling to national security uh, and then Andrel industries which is a company that's a next generation defense contractor with a number of different products and our view is, and we've actually had a lot of discussions, is that the the framework of just war theory is incredibly important. When just war. Just war theory. This is a thousand-year-old tradition about what is the aim of warfare and when is it just to to engage in war. And one of the things that was amazing about um, working with with companies like Andrel is that they had this framework built from, from the very beginning, talking mm -hmm. about where that line is, the types of products they would build, the types of products they wouldn't. Their first product is a perimeter security solution. Uh, it's a, a solution that's really focused solely on defense um you know some of the products that, that oh is that the kid from oculus who's doing that yes palmer lucky is one palmer of lucky who i um, want to have on the podcast palmer but i guess somebody <laughs> in a goddamn news round table went hard at him because of his exit from facebook and now he's like i don't want to come on your podcast you guys make fun of me palmer i want you to come on and talk well he's about he's busy along with with brian and <clears throat> trey and and, and uh, matt and joe working on an incredibly important mission which is to supply the the defense department with next generation defense technology that isn't available to them through the traditional primes right. and this is for the border right well, well, was the no, first project they, they've worked with many many different outfits in the department of defense um See, and and to to us that is incredibly important because the the goal of the company is realizing that we've seen for the last 50 I mean, if you're going back 50 years the department of defense has not had access to the kinds mm -hmm. of software that you and i have access to in our right. workplace the types of computer vision that are just everyday commercialized for for the big companies out here they don't have access to that kind of technology and so building a next generation defense contractor that can sell directly to the department of defense is a noble mission yeah. um, and going back to our discussion of privatization of government you know people want to solve these big problems uh, and it's great to see founders taking on things that that government hasn't been able to solve itself because um, of the gridlock we see in Washington. So I, I loved when he talked about Palmer talked about it initially of using sensors as opposed to building giant walls. Like building a giant wall is you can defeat it with a giant ladder, <laughs> and like there's a million ladders that can go 50 feet high. And you watch all these people just take the ladders and go over the wall. Yeah. But to have the sensors there, to have drones, to have you know, lasers and other kind of sensors, heat sensors to just know what's happening and actually record what's happening, that's going to be much more effective. Well, I'm putting the, 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 the next generation defense technology in the hands of our men and women in uniform. Right. I think this is something that a, a company in Silicon Valley hasn't done. And one of the things that we've been really focused on is finding engineers and companies where that's their first mission. Mm -hmm. uh, to, our, to our point about the, the media conversation around this, you know, there's a lot of people at Google who didn't want to work on that mission. And that caused an upheaval because that Google's n number one mission is not to work with the Department of Defense. But new startups that say we want to work with defense and that's our yeah. sole mission, 
you know, we're excited about those companies because they're very transparent yeah. about their ethics. They're very transparent about the types of products they want to build. Well, and it's crazy. Google uh, really should be ashamed about this. They're they're willing to work on the Dragon, you know, Chinese service uh, in secret and begging the Chinese to put their, you know, search engine and their services into China. But they're not willing to work with our government to defend democracy around the world. It makes yeah. no sense to me. And Microsoft and Amazon have had the other view of they're very excited to work with the uh, Department of yeah. Defense. As, I mean, um, I, that's the weird part. Like, even talking about the border, it's so charged right now. Like, we, after 9-11, we were very clear. Like, yeah, we have to make sure the border is secure because we don't want to die in a terrorist attack. Now you talk about the border, people are like, oh, you're a racist. Oh, you're anti-immigration. You could be pro-immigration still want to have a secure border. Um, let's talk a little about this DoorDash. Uh, and by the way, I'm open for business with weapons technology. I'm fascinated. I'm wondering where the drone is that can like drop a net on somebody and just <laughs> electrocute them and stop them because, no, I mean, this would be much more, I, I actually took a deep dive into this about five or six years ago at one of our events. I was trying to figure out why do non-lethal bullets not exist? Like, why are there not non-lethals that we can put in the first two or three? And, I, you know, I found some of them. Um, it's because we just train our cops that if somebody charges you, you have to kill them. That is the goal is to shoot for the body and to kill them. Um, it, it might be that we should have like a two bullets in there that are non-lethal to start that would just, you know, knock somebody out perhaps. But wh why are we why have we not advanced the primary weapon of police officers in our own country? Like there should be some much better thing. For, for people to use. Okay, moving on. DoorDash files for an IPO. Uh, this is super interesting because um, Uber Eats uh, and Grubhub, I mean, there's massive competition here. And as Bill Gurley pointed out, uh, he looked at how many months of runway in this crazy uh, race. Uh, Grubhub has infinite because they're profitable. Uber Eats had 506 months of runway pretty close to infinite in uh, all things considered and postmates and doordash running out of space did they miss their window you think austin no i don't think they missed their window i mean you look at so uber, to go out and go public uber yeah. eats is an outlier in this right. right because like taking uber eats cash versus like uber's total war chest is right. like that's also that's a fair point they're yeah. public so yeah, yeah it doesn't they matter. got out yeah um yeah, I I don't think they missed their window. I think it's going to be tight. I think for a long time for those guys, it's been, you know, you have to execute right along this line or you're in trouble. But I think they'll get there. And, well, also the market- So long as that, coronavirus doesn't totally I mean, take that, the market down. That That's the interesting thing for me. It, it would seem to be in a coronavirus environment, delivery would be preferable to going to a restaurant with 100 people in it. Yeah, that's that's one of those- you could look at it two ways, right? Like if everybody is hunkered down with food storage, then they don't need to go out. But right. it seems like DoorDash and Uber and Postmates and Grubhub would do better in that world. No, it does seem like they're doing. Did you uh, do some stocking up? All honesty, uh, no. I'm I come from a Mormon family, so if if it all hits the fan, my plan is to drive back to Utah, and they've got everything. They so. got everything in the bunker. Yeah, we don't, the fifty caliber we don't have, on top we of the don't bunker. Have enough space to, to put anything else in our apartment. <laughs> it's fine. That's fine. Did you uh, stocked up a little bit? Yeah, I did a little stocking up. <laughs> yeah, I went crazy. I just was like, I want to buy Clorox wipes yeah. and. I Purell zinc lozenges. I went crazy. I just, yeah, it yeah. just seems like something we should be doing in general anyway. So yeah, we cleared two shelves and filled them with like soup yeah. and you know absolutely spaghettios and whatever. Yeah, my family growing up always had a year of food storage. Are you kidding? No, it's a it's a Mormon thing. Like, is it really? Yeah, part of the doctrine is you always have a year of food storage on hand. That's smart. Uh, that was the other Comes thing. In handy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there could be. It felt like last week. I don't know how you guys felt. Last f week felt, okay, where is the floor here? Could this, could this like be propagating itself, the coronavirus, to a level that is going to cause social unrest? And when I saw people going crazy shopping on Twitter, I was like, that, that's kind of how every zombie movie starts. <laughs> like people go to the store shelves and they're empty. I'm yeah. shocked that the market found support already. I'm, I mean, I, I know they're talking about rate cuts and everything. Yeah. I think, I think they're... If I mean, if the growth rates are what they appear to be, mm. then almost nothing else matters. Like if it's growing that fast to you know mm. two or three of an R null, then yeah. like it's Explain not. Explain what that anything. means. So 
so an R null or an R zero is basically for every person that gets it, how many other people will get it? So it's like the viral coefficient. F- correct. So flu, for example, has an R null of one point two or one point three. So if one person gets it, for every five people that get it, another six person gets it. Six person, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas so far, and it's hard because all the data, like we're not testing in the U.S. the way we should, which is bizarre. which is insane. And China always lies about its numbers anyway, so you can't trust it. But it appears that the R null is between two and three right now. Huh. So basically, one person gets it. Everybody exponential gets it. growth. Right? Yes. And what you're looking for at the, a startup, not in a virus. Right. We're used to seeing those numbers and saying, "Oh my gosh, don't underestimate anything that looks like that growth curve." Right. And that's what we're seeing with coronavirus so far. So the death rate is right now says it's about two percent, which is not huge, but at that growth rate, that's like a million people in a year. Yeah. Right. So we'll see. And then the other thing from a market standpoint is is more, you know, if the Chinese are going to go into total containment mode and no factories are working and supply chains totally stop, then that's a different set of problems and people dying. That's just the economy grinds to a halt. Right. Mm-hmm. So how do, you, how do you look at it, Catherine? You know, I, I'm fascinated by what might happen with some of the con- consumer trends we've already seen. So, you know, I've noticed that everyone's changing to Zoom instead of meeting in person. And that's yeah. actually a much more effective use of time. In some ways, I feel like the next month is going to be a very productive month. Wow, that's a very interesting counter because I was thinking about doing this for our accelerator and mm-hmm. saying maybe for one or two of these, we'll do it virtual. Yeah. And then I was like, wait a second, when we do it virtual, we get like 75 investors and we do it in person, we get like 10. Mm-hmm. So it could actually have a catalytic effect. It could. It could. I, if I think everybody's it could be staying at home pro- anyway and bored. And, yeah. And, and and the technology is there in order to, I mean, we've, we've yeah. already seen this trend with remote work and a lot of the companies we've invested in and a lot of our portfolio companies are, are operating remotely. And so I think we're just going to see people say, actually, we prefer it. Mm. We don't need to be here face to face. We could do yeah. this in, in a way that, that was remote. And so I'm actually excited about it. I'm excited not to shake people's hands. Oh, so I, I hope that lasts. <laughs> so I would great. love to just do the fist pump and, and never have to hug or, or touch anyone. I, I think that would be <laughs> I could teach you the, my solution. I, tweet, I don't know if you saw my tweet, but I'm, I gave away my secret. What I do at any event I have, including my own, and many of you have experienced this when you meet me, people try to shake my hand. Of course, I'm internet famous, right? Like, the, uh-huh. <laughs> not yeah. famous in the real yeah. world, but in the startup world, I'm internet famous. Big People deal. want to take a selfie. I just take my phone, mm-hmm. take a nice hot cup of coffee, mm-hmm. and I'm holding both. Mm-hmm. And people come up and they say, oh, I want to shake your hand. I'm like, oh, okay, f- yeah, let's do an elbow. They're like, all right, great. Mm-hmm. And then when I put the coffee down and somebody tries to shake my hand, I say, I just want to shake your hand. I'm like, actually, you don't. Because about 50 people shake this hand, it's a Petri dish. And I've been saying that one line to people for like a decade. Yeah. And uh, if they do, what I used to do is I'd have somebody right behind me mm-hmm. and I would just shake their hand and then i go like this, boom, I'll get the, my assistant <laughs> we know to plop it into my hand really? and boom, I'll give it a quick wow. rub. Uh, so I just taught people here, just coffee in one hand, phone in the other, never shake hands again. But I think resetting all, to your point, Catherine, about this is we could actually also, in addition to resetting work from home and efficiency and, mm-hmm. and all the gains that brings, we could actually reset standards, cultural standards. Yes. And I know this is another topic that will get me canceled, but I'm trying to get canceled because if I get canceled, I can retire. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to retire on my own. So I'm, please cancel me for this if you can, if you're listening. In America, we're savages. We shake hands. It's the worst possible thing you can do. Mm-hmm. And then in uh, places like Japan, they, they're so close to each other on the trains, there's no way you couldn't get what the person next to you have. They, they overpack stuff the trains, right? Mm-hmm. And people are just too close quarters. They have no sense of personal space, right? You've been to Japan or? Have, yeah. There's no there's no sense of personal space. Yeah. Like people are just literally breathing in your ear on the subway. Mm-hmm. So maybe they could start having a little more personal space. They do have it dialed in with the masks. And then in China, uh, everybody smokes, which puts you at massive risk for this. Yeah. People are hawking loogies everywhere. I was talking to my friend. He said like, he, the thing he's always amazed about in China is the amount that people spit constantly indoors, in malls, everywhere. People are spitting, Right. Um, and the other thing is these wet markets, which is where this supposedly originated. They have to ban wet markets. Do you know what a wet market is? Uh, I, I know about the market where they, they assume this. They call this, it a yeah. wet market. Okay. Pull up a picture of a wet market. Uh, on uh, Wuhan shake. I have seen the Wuhan shake. Here I, it goes, everybody. The Wuhan shake, 
Uh, this is yeah. kind of like you just give a little I, left, I right. I like that. I, I think love that's, it. I would, it's dope. I would love to do that. Yeah, they for, were doing it in Iran eternity. too. I love a Wuhan, <laughs> wu, wu, Wuhan uh, shake. It's beautiful. Yeah. They're just tapping their feet it, together. It also stops that awkward handshake versus hug thing. That's oh, always that's been also a, a horrible topic. Very, and it's just, I, I'm very concerned about that. People are grabbing me and hugging me. And yeah, I'm just like, like, also people take pictures of me all the time and they put their arms around me. Yeah. And I'm always a little concerned. Like I'm I, now, you see me in any photo. My hands are right here in the front. I want after like Joe Biden putting his arm around people, and people are like, <laughs> you "Don't want to have an accidental Me Too moment." Well, like, exactly. Like I don't want to. <laughs> they Joe with Joe Biden. I mean, he's smelling people's hair. Really weird. <laughs> but they have like a million photos of Joe Biden with his hand on women's waist or other you know people's arms. Uh, you know, and it's just like, I, please. I, the last thing I, I'm, I take. 10 pictures a day with people probably yeah. some days like I don't want to have this is a great solution I just think we should we should the, enact the, that the, the, the Wuhan shake but the yeah. wet markets have got to be banned so this is a wet market um, and what you'll notice here is it, it looks like a butcher anywhere else but there are stalls uh, in these wet markets and from how it was explained to me from a Chinese person uh, was that people are concerned about getting fresh uh, meat so they butcher things in front of you Mm -hmm. snakes, frogs, whatever it is. They're going to butcher chickens. They're going to butcher in front of you. I get it. But they're all very closely packed together, these like stalls, and there's blood on the floor everywhere. The reason it's called the wet market is not just because there's like fish in tanks. It's because the floors are bloody and the floors are wet. And there's flies everywhere. The Chinese government knows that this is what's spreading disease like at a massive rate. So I wonder if after this, they'll shut down these wet markets uh, and not have meat hanging out everywhere and not killing things. And then maybe the Chinese citizens will not go to them anymore because they'd be scared of dying. Yeah. I mean, I've lived in places where that's it. Like there is no grocery store. There like, is no grocery store. Either. Yeah. That's, that's how you buy your food and it's that or nothing. So I'd imagine there are places in rural China where that's absolutely the case. They're going to just need to advance this and say, we, we're yeah. going to have to keep food uh, like, like the food I mean, supply like has FDA to be walking around these places giving you grades, right? Maybe I don't believe to... that they're up to the grades yet. No. Yeah. And and that's the thing I think. And so But China's authoritative enough. They can just make that happen whenever they need. <laughs> well, that is the great thing. They did shut everything down. It seems like our response, Catherine, not so good here in the United States. We're not testing anything. Yeah, I mean it it, it seems like we're a in, ter in terms of the, the tests that we're doing on, on people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it seems like that's I mean, we'll see in the next few weeks. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. It's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. The death rate is very hard to understand because we don't have the proper denominator. So they that's, that's the difficult thing is all the numbers are of what we know, and we don't know anything, at least in the U.S. Right? South they've, Korea they've has done total, over 100,000 tests. They've tested a total of 500 people in the U.S. so far. So ridiculous. We should Insane. be testing everybody everywhere all the time. Yeah. Uh, like even if you're not coughing. And the thing that's interesting about this is – I, I think there's a political reason that people are not testing because they don't want to say there's been an outbreak. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the bigger the denominator gets, if the numerator is deaths and the denominator is the total people who have it who didn't die, the percentage of people dying from it goes down, which would actually relieve the panic. Although, if, so somebody, there's two panics, if right? somebody dies and you don't know, there could be numerator out there already dead that we don't know is dead as a result of coronavirus. You would right? have to think a person dying in the last 30 days <laughs> from a cold, people would test them That's fair. for it. I would, the, at this point, the I would The other think. interesting thing I was reading about last night is the pharmaceutical supply chain has ground to a halt because people aren't manufacturing in China like they used to. So there's yes. actually a result, there's actually a fear of like, will we fundamentally run out of the ability Drugs. to test things because we don't have, because we buy all that from China. That, that Catherine goes to your point about like w stress testing. This is like a giant stress test, right? Like, and I think part of the stress test is, well, what's made in China? And if these things keep happening, what should we have redundancy for that can get made in other places? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, if I'm Apple right now, I have to be thinking about, wouldn't it have been nice to actually have built an iPhone plant here? Like, <laughs> if Elon can build Teslas in America, I think Tim Cook can build a phone here. Yeah. And if it adds $100 or $200 each phone, better that than not have phones. Although it did seem like a whole lot of Elon's problems got solved when they finally went into China. They're like, oh, well, no, I have this is how manufacturing <laughs> is supposed to work. They built that factory in no time at all. Yeah. It was pretty crazy. It's insane. 
Yeah. All right, Robinhood, uh, one of my investments, uh, full disclosure. That's just me. Uh, I have a Robinhood account. You have a Robinhood account? Yeah. You scary. love it? I do like it uh, when it works. Do you trade? I do. Yeah. Uh, all right, what are your top holdings? What are you bullish on? You bullish on Disney? Uh, right now, I'm actually short SPY. You're short? I'm short the S&P 500. Wow. I think coronavirus is still underrated. Ah. Interesting. Uh, well, Robinhood went down right as the markets were rebounding. Uh, system-wide outage three minutes after the market opened today, Monday, uh, March 2nd. Dow Jones was way up. This is a kind of a problem, I guess, for startups uh, if that happens. Users are uh, really upset, obviously. I don't know. Going after a stock trading app for potential lost gains feels a little... Yeah. yeah it's a little tough. Like well, everybody, tough. everybody had imaginary gains they didn't lock in when the yeah. stock was down. All right. Well, right. given that you're an expert now, Austin, on uh, <laughs> PR disasters, <laughs> yeah, give Robin Hood, give Vlad some advice. Oh, How do you man. handle this? I mean, this is, this is a <laughs> create an 800 one. number. But uh, no, what I like, what I think is the winning strategy for now going forward is just the more transparency, the better. The more upfront you are, the better. Yeah. And I mean, this one's tough because not only was it down, it was down the entire day. Yep, and right. that's what you do is a stock trading app. But it's it's been down before. Other yeah. stock apps are down. Yeah. Um, so why I don't. Why not just create an eight hundred number and have like a backup ready to go for people to make trades? That's what I would do uh, in this situation. That's tough to verify. Like, what if you get that wrong? Right. Like, what if? Oh, if the person calls in and you get it wrong. I mean, it's it's hard to set up infrastructure like that. Yeah, you overnight. can't pop it up. I yeah. was just saying. I wonder if the long term would be to have some backup like that. Email trades, phone trades. Sure. Yeah. I don't. Mm. I haven't Something. seen their response. How, how did you think they handled the response? I haven't seen the response. I think this is still ongoing. Is yeah. it back up and running? Uh, still down? It. it looks like it's up. Huh. Yeah, I think to, to Austin's point, I think we've learned transparency is always the best option. And, and you know, millennial users in particular are very forgiving. Hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see the, the response. Yeah. What are you investing in now, Catherine, as we, as we wrap up here? What are you interested in outside of, we heard, military tech? Anything else you're interested in? And what stage do you invest in? So I invest in early stage, um, so seed in Series A. Okay, so that's 250K to $3 million checks? Um, so actually a little larger than that. So okay. Series A, you know, we lead Series A's. Um, okay, it's five, ten million. Yeah. Yeah, right. but um, but focused on on both both stages, and and I love highly regulated industries. So anything like aerospace, defense, computational biology, anything with a regulatory moat, uh, mm -hmm. I get very excited about. Very cool. And you met Austin, and you passed on Lambda School. I understand. Oh, I've been I've been a big fan of Austin's. <laughs> but uh, you since passed the, since the very beginning. But you met so. him and you passed. I don't think we've raised actually since we last met. Yeah, but I. I've, and now we're beyond that stage. Yeah, for right. Sure. But cattle, does General Catalyst have a growth fund? Like so we do actually. So we're sector and stage mm. agnostic. We write checks <laughs> from 500K all the way up to 100 million pre-IPO. Look at this. Um, Look and at and we're here. all generalists. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I mean, a... And, and, as part of this round, did you do a... Uh, sorry to cut you off there. Did you... This is very important. Uh, Austin, did you do like a little angel sidecar there for like your friends? <laughs> little, is there a little like way <laughs> to weasel my way in for a, a hundy or a two hundy here? Uh, let's chat offline. I would love to weasel my way in for a hundy two hundy. I mean, that's the only reason I was defending you on Twitter is to just weasel my <laughs> way into the I, Now table. I see what this podcast yeah, is. This podcast <laughs> is called Deal Flow. Start your own. <laughs> no, actually, I would love to put a hundy or two hundy in. I would just ship that like today. I think you probably have a realistic valuation, but I just want to see you succeed. Um, because what you're doing is important. I think what you're doing is important. Thank you. So don't let the bastards get you down. That's what Chris Christopherson told Sinead O'Connor when they booed her at the Bob Dylan 30th anniversary concert. Remember that? I, Bob I, Dylan I had his big concert. <laughs> Sinead O'Connor came out to sing. You yeah. know, she had ripped up the picture of the yeah. po Pope yeah. on Saturday Night Live. Yep. And she said, fight the real enemy because she knew the Catholic Church had had this molestation problem. And she said, the Pope is, you know, uh, you know, turning a blind eye to this. This is in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and she went out to sing at Madison Square Garden. I was there for the 30th anniversary of Bob Dylan concert. I remember like it was yesterday. You were there? I was there. Wow. Bob Dylan's my favorite artist. And they had this 30th Columbia Records 30th anniversary for him. And I went uh, with my friend Charlie and they booed her. But half the audience was cheering her. And then half was kind of groaning mm -hmm. because she had been on Saturday Night Live, I think two, two nights before or something. And uh, she was going to sing uh, a Dylan song. And Chris Christopherson walked, her out, walked out and just put his arm around her. And he whispered in her ear. And it was audible on uh, like some of the post recordings. And he said, don't let the bastards bring you down. And I, I just like think that. that's yeah. like something that always stuck with me. 
Like there's always going to be those critics. But she was right. She was right and she was brave long before anybody challenged the church, especially for an Irish person yeah. to, ch to challenge the church. It's pretty hard uh, with her family and everything like that. Uh, well, continued success. If you're doing a Series A uh, or a Seed, uh, you know how to get Catherine. It's KTM Boyle. Do you have rules to reach you? Or if no, somebody no, emails you a chart, would you look at it or do you DMs, have rules? DMs are open. DMs are open. Yeah, wow. yeah. You don't have a rule set? No. Okay, because Jeremy Lights at Lightspeed has an 18-point tweet storm oh, on, <laughs> on how you have to approach him. Yeah. Are your DMs open? My, of course my DMs are open. <laughs> I, I, Wide my, open DMs. My DMs are open for a while. Wide no open longer. DMs. Too popular now. Well, it's just like <laughs> people would email me and be like, hey, what's my admission status? I was like, I, I don't know. Like you should email the admissions people. That's what happened to you. There you go. <laughs> Boom. I have my new soundboard that we're going to be working on. Uh, but yeah, so if you can just get me into Austin, like just a little piece for J-Cal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Continued success, everybody. And uh, if you have a um, military uh, company, Catherine and I are open for business. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Some military tech is in that, here. Is that the open for business sound? That's the open. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's the military. <laughs> it's like a siren. There oh, there it is. There oh, look at that. There's a DM coming in for us, Catherine. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> no lethal bullets. <laughs> oh, what is that? It's a drone with a net on it. <laughs> we can capture that New York Magazine writer. Hit him with the stun gun. We're getting it wrong? No comment. No comment. <laughs> I'm going to have him on. I'm going to hear his side. Yeah, no, you should. Anyway, I, th I think you should start. This is your power move. I'm going to give you a power move, Austin. All right. Start a pod. Start a pod. You should start a pod on education and dunk on all these people. <laughs> because think about it. You master Twitter. Like, I didn't know even who you were. And all of a sudden, you come out. You're in my DMs. You're following me. Then you get on the pod. Then you unfollow me after you got on the pod. I get it. <laughs> It was a smart move, right? You're replying to me, and then I get you on the podcast. Did pod. I do that? You did. It was okay, because I post like 20 <laughs> video clips a day. Okay. Um, the power move is to follow me, mute me. I, that one I get. Right. But anyway, you should just do a podcast. Literally, every two weeks, you interview somebody about education. It'll be bigger than the people covering you. And then, you have you like me, like you can't cancel me. P please try. <laughs> I have 300,000 followers. What do you got, 100,000 followers, 200,000? Yeah. yeah, you can't be canceled. <clears throat> please, by all means, I talked about Chinese people spitting in malls and wet markets and crowded trains and how you disgusting humans are. Just holding I, 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 I can be canceled. I, talked I about, have like 5,000 I can't followers. be canceled. I talked about exactly <laughs> personal space needs to be increased yeah. and no more shaking of hands. Please respect the fist bump, everybody. Catherine, great job on the pod. And Austin, continued success fighting the good fight. Don't let the bastards bring you down. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. <laughs> <laughs>